What do you think? Is it fair if a candidate is elected president while his opponent wins the popular vote? Is it fair if a party wins 45% of the votes and that results in a two-third majority in parliament? Well, both has happened. A former in the US, you all know that, the latter in Hungary. But should it be like that? And how does that happen anyway? Using some math can be quite eye-opening and can actually help to improve democratic procedures. So let me take you on a very gentle journey. Here is the story of a school principal. Let's call him John. John is confronted with a fierce discussion at his school to abolish homework assignments. Well, while he is convinced that homework assignments do have a pedagogical benefit, he can't stop the controversy. So as a very last resort to settle the issue, he promises to hold some sort of a democratic ballot among the students. Ban homework, yes or no? Well, here's the situation. 19 of the students want to abolish homework, and only eight are in favor of keeping it. So that's it. The vast majority of the students wants to abolish homework assignment once and for all. So John's lost. Well, not quite. He did promise to hold or to settle this issue in a democratic way. But no specific voting system was agreed on. So he, just, he suggested one, and the students agreed on that, which is quite popular. Majority voting, but involving representatives of the student council. So, in the first step, the students select a delegate by majority voting to three councils. Each council is representing the students from the elementary classes, the uh, junior high classes, and the senior classes. Then, these level councils elect a representative to the student council, and the student council takes the vote, and no ban wins. A 70% majority among the students for abolishing homework is turned upside down to a two-thirds victory to keep it. Well, just imagine something like that would happen in big politics. Well, actually, it does. Particularly in representative democracies, like the US or UK, which are based on simple majority votings in districts. Let's look at a tiny little nation, a fictitious nation, of course, with just two parties and 45 voters, 30 in favor of the blue party and 15 in favor of the red party. Now suppose you are in charge of a committee to split or dissect the territory into nine districts for electing representatives to parliament, one each. How, how would you do that? Well, the most natural choice, of course, is some sort of a chessboard structure. But first of all, you think about the question what would be fair. Well, blue has a two-thirds majority, and you want to split the territory into nine districts, so it fair would be something like, same proportion, six to three for blue. And now you split it with a most natural chessboard-like structure, and what you see is a nine to zero win for blue. Blue wins every single district, typically by a small margin, but that's it. Then you may reconsider and think about this outcome, and maybe you come to the conclusion that it would be better 
if the Red Party would be represented in Parliament as well. And so your committee may come up with a different districting in order to make sure that this happens. What you see, red is indeed winning one district. And if you think this is too artificial, too arbitrary, and well, well off, far off from reality, think again. This is the fourth congressional district in Illinois. This earmuff structure has been created based on a federal court's ruling to create some district with a majority Hispanic population. This was the attempt to attenuate the strange effects of the American voting system by a similarly strange intervention. And of course, gerrymandering is really a big issue in the US, but Typically, it is not really motivated by the wish to better represent society. But districting is not easy. So, if you do it like that, you see red is now winning 5 to 4, while still the blue voters are in two-third majority. And then one member of your committee might even suggest something different, districting like that. Now, a, uh, red is winning 8 to 1. And of course, except for the supporters of the Red Party, everybody would object. You and your committee would say, come on, this is not fair. Previously, we had districtings, no matter what shape they were, of, of the same size of voters. And here now, there is an imbalance. Well, again, these kind of anomalies occur in reality. In England, for example, the largest district is twice as large as the smallest, and in all of UK, the, there is a factor, a factor of five even. So look, let's look at the situation in Germany. Germany does have a proportional voting system, so the number of representatives depends on the number of votes. However, about half of the delegates, members of parliament, are, uh, are elected directly in districts. And of course, there are regulations, there are electoral laws specifying what is reasonable, what is regarded reasonable and what not. So, for example, the, the districting should not be too much off the average. It shouldn't be off more than 15%. And it must not be off more than 25%. The much stricter EU regulation asks for 10% at most. And here is what it is. This is the last federal election, 2017, and the yellow uh, shaded area shows you the, the districts which are off by more than 10%, the EU recommendation. And the orange part is off more than 15%. And of course, there are other constraints. The districts should be connected. They should be of reasonable shape, they should observe state limits, and they should not split municipalities. So the problem really is to group municipalities into districts in such a way that this is balanced. Mathematically, the solution comes with a couple of the ingredients. One is a way to capture all the districtings in one single object. The second is a precision of what reasonable shape should mean. And the third, then, is an algorithm for actually doing the districting. So let's look at the first part. You can actually identify each districting with a point in one single geometric object, like that. And the most reasonable districtings uh, belong to the vertices, correspond to the vertices. Now, this object, as depicted, lives in three-dimensional space. The districting 
polytope for Germany lives in somewhat higher dimension, more than 3 million. However, you can actually solve the problem there. You start uh, from a district, districting, and then follow edges of this object and get to an optimum districting. But the main problem is the balancing. And of course, then the question of reasonable shape. To get an idea, let's look at an area which has to be serviced from three service stations, the red, the blue, and the green one. If you suppose that the customers go to the nearest service station, then of course it's quite, na quite natural to assign to red the area which is shaded in red here, which, is, which consists of all the points which are closer to, uh, to the red than to the green or the blue station. And of course, this produces a partitioning of the whole service area into three regions. Well, unfortunately, this partitioning doesn't pay any attention to a balancing. So it might happen, as in this example, that the blue region is very sparsely populated. There are three times as many customers or voters in the green region and another three times more in the red region. So there is a lot more work to be done. And then there is still this issue of reasonable shape. And it turns out that this issue is very closely connected, actually governed by the choice of distance that we apply. Let's look at another example. Here we have 100 voters who should be assigned to four districts. And if we do that by just taking the airline distance, actually the square of the airline distance, we get a quite reasonable assignment which is completely balanced. The problem here is that this assignment doesn't observe anything related to the underlying state. And you may argue that this yellow voter is left alone in, his enclave, uh, in the enclave of the state. But there are other op alternatives. You might as well use the shortest path to the ballot, for instance, and get a districting like that. And there are even more and even different possibilities uh, to observe certain political requirements. And it's politics, actually, that defines these requirements. It's parliament that defines that. And mathematics can only help to understand the effect of what's happening and do the optimization. And if you do that in Germany, you see the outcome. Left is what you saw before and right is uh, using the shortest path distance, um, what happens out of the rearrangement, and you see everything is light green or even dark green. And if you compare things not to the federal um, average, but to the state average, it gets even better. Now, the nice thing here, as you can see, is that mathematics can actually help to improve democratic procedures. The strength of a field is that once you understand certain structures, you might as well use them in order to solve some other problems as well. So here, for example, the districts could be grains in a hybrid material. They could be customers with a similar insurance risk. Or they could be related to agriculture, to farming. Here is a typical region in agricultural region in Germany mostly in Bavaria. And you can see here the coloring refers to the farmer who is cultivating the specific lot. And of course, it is economically much, much uh, better not to have the lots distributed that way, so all over the place, but to have them more concentrated. And there is an in, uh, initiative, land lease agreement, voluntary land lease agreement to do the rearrangement. This problem turns out to be a very similar structure than the districting problem. Actually, there are other uh, conditions, of course. You don't want to have uh, uh, farmers of the same farming size, but you want to have the same uh, total area of a farmland before and after the rearrangement. 
And then there are issues concerning to the so quality of soil, concerning uh, EU subsidies and other criteria. But then the problem is very, very similar um, to the problem we just looked into. We identify the centers of gravity of the lots um, with points in the plane, then we do the districting and we get the rearrangement. Now, on November 11, 1947, Winston Churchill said when addressing the House of Commons, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all others that have been tried from time to time. I personally agree that he is right. But then every citizen should be aware of the strange artifacts that seemingly natural democratic procedures can produce. Well, the underlying mathematics might not always be particularly trivial, and you might not always want to dive into it too deeply, but you don't have to. All you should do is to look more closely into how decisions are actually made, how the system is set up to make democratic decisions. And then, I promise to you, you will be on very high alert when you hear this unavoidable talk about people's will or voters' mandate in the future again. After all, already our principal John knew exactly that the outcome of a democratic decision process of a ballot may depend dramatically on the format that you're choosing. And with respect to the underlying mathematics, what is good for democracy is also good for agriculture, for material science, for business, and for all sorts of other human endeavors. Thank you.